thank you very much for having me. Um, my name is Yun Sun, and I'm originally from China, and I work on Chinese foreign policy here in the uh, in the Xinjiang community. Uh, I know that Andrew just uh, spoke for the last session, and it's very difficult to speak after Andrew because I'm sure he has covered everything. Um, so I'll try to try to uh, give you a slightly different perspective because I know Andrew talked about why Middle East, why Africa, especially Middle East, matters to China, and I'm going to talk more about where does Africa, Africa and Middle East fit fit in China's foreign policy. Um, China is a great power, of course, it follows starting from, uh, well, the mantra was set up in around 2012, 2013, that China as a big power will follow the principle of the diplomacy of a great power. And what it means is that a great power needs to have a global diplomacy. So it cannot just focus on the area uh, on China's periphery or focus on, on one specific um, geographic region. Instead, it needs to have an all-directional foreign policy, an all-round uh, foreign policy. So that principle dictates that uh, Chinese foreign policy is not just about one country or one region or one specific cluster of regions, but instead China will seek to develop relations with all countries and all regions. Um, and, like, uh, and under this principle, China has uh, designed a specific strategic mapping for all the regions and countries in the in the world, and this this mantra basically is uh, is is well very well repeated and very well implemented in uh, in Chinese foreign policy community today. And the mantra is called China's periphery is priority, and big power relations are the key. Developing countries are the foundation of China's foreign policy, and the multilateral platforms are the stage for for China. So in Chinese, it's that most important thing. Region is the main thing. Developing countries are the key to the region. So this wording seems to suggest that all regions are important, but not all regions are created equal. In reality, um, in the practice of Chinese foreign policy, relationship with great powers and the relationship with China's periphery have always been regarded as the top priorities for Chinese foreign policy. And there has been this debate as for which one is more important. Is, is the relationship with the United States more important for China? Or is the relationship with Asian countries, with China's, pre, uh, with China's neighbors, more important for, for China? And this debate has transpired itself in, a, in an argument, in two arguments that was developed by, um, by the two sides. So people who emphasize that the relationship with the United States is more important would say that if China has good relationship with the United States, the United States will not seek to create trouble in China's periphery. And as a result, China will naturally have a good relationship with, uh, with its neighbors. And that's one, that's one argument. The counter argument from people who want to place more emphasis on Asian countries would say that if China does not prioritize relationship with Asian countries, that will create the opportunity for the United States to come in and align itself with Asian countries and undermine China's national security in this neighborhood. So this debate has been has been ongoing basically pretty much through the um, the ten years under President Hu Jintao, who is the predecessor of uh, of the current President Xi Jinping, from 2002 to 2012. Then um, in 2013. Xi Jinping was inaugurated as uh, as uh, paramount leader of China, and one of the one of the key things that he did was to host the um, the what they call the Zhou Bian Hui Hui is a working com a working conference on China's relationship with with its periphery, and this conference is regarded as having answered the question as to which one is more important, periphery or great power relations, because Xi Jinping placed the priority. Um, periphery <coughs> after this conference. And from what we can see, the Belt and Road Initiative at the very, um, from its very early stage, it's also designed to uh, develop a relationship or consolidate a relationship with China's, uh, China's neighbors to begin with. So this does not seem to directly correlate with the issue of uh, Africa or Middle East, right? Because uh, Africa and Middle East they are not on China's periphery. 
they are um, they also do not belong to the category of uh, great powers, especially not the United States. So this sort of answers the question that where does Africa and where does Middle East fit in China's foreign policy priority priority list, which is uh, they are not regarded as a priority. Um, but that is in comparison to other regions like North America or Asian, uh, or Asian region. But it doesn't mean that these two regions do not have other importance for China. If you want to look at how Africa and the Middle East are viewed in China, or more generally, how, where do they fit in, uh, in China's foreign policy, um, I think it's very important to understand how China sees the world and how China sees its desired world vision. What kind of world does China, does China envision? So, um, we know that historically China has had basically a concentric circle, a tributary system in, in East Asia. And the reason that China is called the Middle Kingdom is because China saw itself at the center of the uh, universe, the center of the system. That is surrounded by other, um, by other states that are smaller and would pay tribute to, to China. So, if you remember, you probably have all seen the movie uh, Hero by director Zhang Yimou. And that was about uh, 20 years ago, or 15, um, 16 years ago. So if you, if you remember what the, what the movie Hero was describing, it was basically describing what the Chinese vision of a world should look like. Then remember, so the, the assassin uh, played by Jet Li, he has basically for the majority of the movie, try to develop different ways to, to assassinate the, uh, the emperor team. But in the end, when he really had the opportunity, he gave up that opportunity. He instead um, decided not to, not to go ahead with the assass assassination. And when he was asked as well why he, was do was why he would do that and give up, uh, abandon all his previous efforts, he wrote two letters on the, on the ground. And the two Chinese characters are Tianxia. Tianxia literally translated as all under heaven. Everything that is under heaven. So the, what is reflected in this, uh, in this, in this uh, manifestation is that what the Chinese traditionally see is a hegemonic stability system. That, remember in the, in the hero movie, Jack Lee realized that the reason or the cause, the origin of all the war and conflicts was because there was not one single country that was strong enough to conquer all the land and implement one system. So instead, he decided in the end that only Emperor Qin could realize his vision of Tianxia and united the whole China under one, under one government, and one system. And only that one government, one, one army was strong enough to make sure that the smaller countries do not fight with each other. So if you think about it, it's the Chinese version of a hegemonic stability theory. So the principle of hegemonic stability, in my, in my view, is deeply embedded in the Chinese philosophical sub, uh, subscription to the Confucianism. So if you think about Confucianism, which is, is the origin of the, um, everything Chinese, um, despite its emphasis on morality and harmony, the Confucianism instills a very strictly defined social structure and a hierarchy and a system. So in the Chinese con conception of the, uh, the world order following Confucianism, harmony does not exist or harmony does not originate from equality. So the world is harmonious not because everybody is equal, but instead it is because that there is a well-informed hierarchical roles and responsibilities assigned according to actors' material and moral competence. So if you look at the if you look at the Chinese system today, the government is trying to create a harmonious, harmonious society. But the harmonious society concept is not based on the fact that all Chinese citizens are created equal. And they do emphasize the morality or the, uh, the merits, the meritocracy of the Chinese system. That the leaders who are at important positions who are on the higher level of the hierarchy has demonstrated that they have, they have moral and material competence. 
So in that sense, when the Chinese look at the world, although the Chinese foreign policy principle would argue that all countries, regardless of whether you're big or small, whether you're strong or weak, are created equal, that in reality is not a practice of the Chinese foreign policy. They always see the world as a, as a hierarchy. And what China needs to do is to strive for the highest, the maximum position that it can, it can create for itself. So reflecting in international relations, this vision stipulates that peace and stability happen when and only when states recognize and pledge their deference to the strong and morally benevolent uh, hegemon and observe the rule of the system developed and implemented, enforced by the hegemon. So when the existing hegemon is weakened or eliminated, the stability of the system will crumble. So the Chinese conception of this concept of the Middle Kingdom, in essence, is identical to the Western notion of a, of a hegemon. The Middle Kingdom, historically, China historically, possessed economic and political preponderance in the region, including the size of its territory, a large economy, cultural supremacy, political strengths, and military force. The Middle Kingdom established a hegemonic regime, a tributary system organized around a hierarchy of concentric circles with hegemons in the center, China as the Middle Kingdom, and the provinces, vassal states, and tributary states on the periphery. So the, king, uh, the Middle Kingdom possessed both the capacity, the capability, and the will to enforce the hierarchical order and the hegemonic system by countering challenges and rejections through diplomacy, coercion, and persuasion. So remember in the, in the, in the movie um, Hero, when the smaller states like uh, Kingdom Zhao or Kingdom Han, they challenged the, uh, the authority of the, of the uh, Qing, um, uh, the Qing Kingdom, the military conflict followed, and Qin, uh, the Qin Emperor needed to use wage war to defeat these other smaller states and their challenge to the system. So the Middle Kingdom is not just, in the Chinese perception, it's not just based on its material, military, or political, and economic capacity. It's also based on a, a norm, or what, they, what the Chinese would call the moral codes of the, the system. So the moral codes and moralistic model of a Middle Kingdom forms the normative rules of the, um, of the world system. And there's such a moral code in China's view. The, the uh, moral code would require tolerance and harmonious coexistence of different cultures, different religions, different ethnicity, and different government system. And that plays a lot into China, today China's policy towards Africa and the Middle East, because the Chinese would emphasize that although we have different political systems, or maybe we have different religion, but under the, the Chinese moralistic hegemonic stability theory, we should be able to coexist and we should be able to work with each other. And that has been the historical precedent in the Tang Dynasty um, and well, less, to the, less in the Song Dynasty and the Ming Dynasty. So ideally, the harmonious coexistence would be based on a shared vision of stability and prosperity among all members of the system. Also, the enforcement of such an order relies on the coercive power of the, uh, of the hegemon. So in this sense, China sees itself both as the endogenous, so the um, internal and exogenous external factor to the desired world, world order because its hegemonic dominance is both a character and a guarantee of the, of the system. So that's basically how China sees the world in the concentric circles. So coming to Xi Jinping's foreign policy, of course, the most important, uh, the most important region as defined is the region that's closest to the Middle Kingdom, to the center. And that would be the region on China's periphery, the Asia region. And then the concentric circle will go, will go, is, uh, will go out. And that's why Middle East and Central um, Middle East has been defined, or once, um, once for all, defined as a grand periphery, or the Da Zhou Bian. So it's not in China's immediate periphery, but it's further out. Um, and then Africa is, uh, is, is not really currently in this, uh, in this, uh, in this system. But it doesn't mean that China does not have its, um, have its interest in Africa. So from this angle, if you look at China's world vision as its concentric circles, if you look at this angle on Africa and the Middle East, they're not a priority or the priority directions of Chinese foreign policy. I mean, there has to be a sequencing. There has to be prioritization. 
So I remember having this conversation with Chinese analysts as for which region is least important for China's foreign policy. And they would argue at that time it was Latin America because it was far away, it was not on China's periphery, and China's political ties were the threat that can be posed by Latin America to China is relatively low. But then in that case, Africa would be placed as the second lowest priority for China's foreign policy. And they also made a comparison between this prioritization uh, of China and prioritization of the United States. And Latin America is certainly not the lowest priority for the United States. And in their perception, Africa is, because Latin America still is very close to US homeland. And then in the case of, uh, in the case of Middle East, the Chinese perception is that the Middle East is important for the United States because of several things. Because one, US allies, there's Israel. There are also other allies of the United States in the region. Secondly, uh, there's oil. And the, the supply of crude oil by the Middle East as a region is regarded as an important public good that the United States as a global hegemon provides to the, uh, uh, provides to the world, especially through the stabilization or the stability of the region. And the last but not least, there is also the region of the uh, counterterrorism, so uh, the clash of civilizations. Um, but for China, the current important, uh, when China compares its priority in the Middle East to the United States priorities in the Middle East, China's current emphasis is on its periphery. China does not have allies in the, in the Middle East. And the China's dependence on um, the Middle East crude oil, it, it, it is still high, but it has been decreasing in the, um, in the past few years. So for example, in 2017, only 43% of China's crude oil import was from, from the Middle East, which is much lower than, uh, than the previous two-thirds, or at one point, as high as uh, 70%. And Russia has uh, surpassed Saudi Arabia and became China's largest crude oil uh, supplier in the, in the world. Can you repeat that figure? I'm sorry, how much percent? I'm sorry? I didn't hear the figure. Oh, 2017, 43%. 43%. 43%. So it's still high, but it's lower than before. So in the case of the counterterrorism, China's counterterrorism effort primarily is focused on its homeland security. So they're focused on the domestic terrorism or the domestic, what they call the three evils, the separatism, uh, extremist, religious extremism, and, um, and violent extremism, separatism, and terrorism. So the, that's called the three evils. But for, for China, the counterterrorism, the international aspect is important, but their primary focus is due, uh, is due domestic, especially in the Xinjiang region. So that's where, uh, where they basically fit in China's uh, foreign policy. But the importance of a region for China, of course, is de depends on China's national interest in these regions. So although according to the prioritization, they may not be high priority issues, but it doesn't mean that China doesn't have important national interest in those, in those two regions. And if I may, I would like to compare what kind of national interest that China pursues, <coughs> both in, in Africa and in the Middle East. And I would divide China's national interest into five categories. Sorry, that's a lot. Uh, political, economic, security, ideological, and reputational. So if we look at the political, why is, why is Africa important for China's political interest? To begin with, there is the issue of uh, Taiwan. So basically, starting from 1949, since, uh, since the beginning of the People's Republic of China, China has been competing with Taiwan for international recognition. And that goes to the legitimacy, the civil war of, the, of China and the legitimacy competition between the Chinese Communist Party and the, the Nationalist Party, which currently occupies Taiwan. That this, the basic instinct is that the more countries recognize your legitimacy internationally, the more legitimate that you are compared to the other one. So in the case of Africa, there has been this, uh, what they call the textbook diplomacy or the textbook war between, <coughs> uh, between China and Taiwan. And basically, before 2000, um, 2005, 2008, Taiwan was pretty successful in that campaign. But <coughs> during the Cultural Revolution, if you look at how China basically provided free grants or free foreign aid to African countries to gain the recognition of the, uh, of the uh, African, African states, 
Africa is regarded as China's solid friend because from the very early on, China, in collaboration well, with the support of the Soviet Union, was able to obtain the diplomatic recognition of, uh, of most of the African states. And today, only one country still maintains diplomatic ties with, uh, with Taiwan in Africa, and that's the Swaziland. Basically, in the past three years, China uh, stole well, I won't call stop. China was able to obtain the diplomatic recognition of three out of four of Taiwan's diplomatic allies or diplomatic uh, diplomatic partners in, in Africa. And that was very much related to China's uh, infrastructure financing, the development financing that was providing. So Africa is important for the reason of Taiwan, and Africa is also important politically for China because 54 African countries. Well, when China comes to Africa, it comes both North, and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, in the United States, we usually talk about Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in the Chinese, in the Chinese foreign policy point of view, 54 African countries form a very important voting bloc at multilateral institutions such as the United Nations. And if you talk to Chinese diplomat, every single one of them who work on Africa will tell you that in 1971. It was the support of African countries that helped China to resume its seat at the United Nations to replace Taiwan. So this, this support at the multilateral institutions such as UN has always been regarded as an important political interest of China <coughs> coming to Africa. So if we, if we can compare, why is Middle East important for China politically? Primarily two reasons, and these two reasons are, are related. The first one is China's relationship with, with Muslim countries. So during the, during the Cold War, during the Cultural Revolution, um, that era, the support or the recognition of uh, Arab countries of China as a, legitimate, as a legitimate power or as an international power has always been important, which is why the China did not establish diplomatic relations with Israel basically up until 1990. So for the very long, for the majority of the Cold War, China chose to side with Arab countries and refused to extend diplomatic recognition of Israel because China wanted, well, Arab, Arab countries had a bigger number. Mm. So for China, that was always an important concern, the relationship with, uh, with Muslim countries. And the second issue which really bubbled up and heated up since, uh, since 2009 is China's own Muslim problem. And that's the Xinjiang Autonomous Region, which is uh, basically one-sixth of China's to total territory, the largest province in China, but occupied by, historically occupied by the, uh, by the Uyghur minorities. And we know that in, 2000, in July 5th of 2009, the Uyghur population in Xinjiang started a riot because they were, uh, they were discontent with uh, the central government's policy was the, the ethnic policy and its religious policy. And that creates an international recognition of the, uh, of the Uyghur problem. And these Muslim countries started to wonder that whether China as a government is persecuting Muslims domestically. And before 2009, although this issue existed, it was not a high, high profile issue. But the 2009 Wumuti riot really brought the issue under the spotlight on the international stage. And at one point, we saw Muslim communities in, for example, in uh, Indonesia mm -hmm. and Ayatollahs in Iran began to state their support to the, uh, to the Uyghur Muslims in, in China. And that raised a lot of concerns in China because if these Muslim populations are going to receive support from these uh, Muslim countries, then that's going to make the Chinese national security or the Chinese territory integrity because of Uyghurs, eventually they are moderate Sunni population, and eventually what they do seek to establish is a moderate Muslim state that is independent from China. So for China, the concern is if the Muslim population in China are going to receive the support and the international recognition for their separatist campaign, then China, as China, will not be able to maintain its, uh, its, current, its current status. So how to manage the relationship with Muslim countries to prevent them from providing support to the Uyghur population has always been a key priority in China's relationship with, uh, with Muslim countries. So that's politics, political interest. Taiwan, 
multilateral uh, organizations for, uh, on the case of Africa, relationship with Muslim countries, and the issue of, uh, of Xinjiang, of Uyghur, in the case of uh, China's political interest in terms of its relationship with, with Middle East. That's politics. And secondly, let's talk about economics. Why is Africa important for China economically? I know that international media or international, um, international reporting on China's relationship with Africa has focused a lot as, um, on China's economic engagement with Africa, as if that this relationship is so important for China. Why well, is it important for a couple of reasons? That one, Africa does have a uh, very rich natural resources reserve, and for a very long time when China was developing its own economy, and needs the raw materials to supply its domestic industrialization. So I would say that between year 2000 to the year 2015, natural resources has played a very important role in China's trade relationship with, uh, with Africa. And if you look at the, the Africa export to, to China, overwhelming majority of uh, African <coughs> export to China has been natural resources. But that's only one piece of the story. Africa is also important for China because it's a big market. Not in the sense that African population are rich enough to buy Chinese products, but because Africa is a very large service contract market for Chinese suppliers. That um, I don't know if you've, you've seen the, uh, some of the documentaries about Chinese infrastructure contractors, that basically China has the largest and the strongest infrastructure development companies in, in the world. It's, it's, it's a result of several factors. One, because uh, these are all state-owned enterprises, so they have had monopoly and privilege in, inside China, and they have, had, and they have received the concessional preferential treatment from the Chinese government. And it goes back to 2008 when there was an international financial crisis, Chinese government freaked out and put 4 trillion RMB, which is uh, well, divided by 6, would be US dollars. So Chinese government threw 4 trillion RMB into the Chinese domestic infrastructure market in order <coughs> to create job opportunities and create uh, business opportunities for these uh, state-owned enterprises. And what it has created are these monster companies that can build infrastructure in, uh, uh, at an unprecedented speed and on an unprecedented scale. So when China looks at its uh, state-owned service contractors, these state-owned companies, one important aspect is that they also need markets. And the Chinese market after the, the 4 trillion RMB campaign is pretty much saturated. So when they look, up, look around, look at the world, that where can these companies go? And Africa has become a very attractive um, market for Chinese service especially infra infrastructure construction. So not only um, some of these projects are funded by the domestic, the sovereign governments of African countries, some of them are, fo are funded by international donors like World Bank and IMF. And if the Chinese companies have to compete for a bidding, they, they, they have a very good chance of winning because of the salary of the Chinese engineers and Chinese workers compared with their Western counterpart is still relatively low and they can control the pace, control the speed, they can shorten the speed because the Chinese workers are also famous for working three shifts every day, so 24 hours and seven days a week, so they can, they usually can put up a very good bid for, the, uh, for this type of bidding. Um, so that's why Africa has been regarded as a, a key trading partner with China, not because of the natural resources, but because of the service contracts that Chinese, the Chinese can gain. But here's the problem. Africa needs infrastructure. Everyone knows that. But the reason that they don't have infrastructure is not because they don't want them, but because they don't have the money to fund them. Infrastructures are usually long-term mega projects that it takes longer to build, and it takes a lot of money to fund, and that the return is usually slow. That if you build a road and you collect the tolls, it's going to take 10, 20 years, if not more, to really get back to the uh, to pay back the loans. So the the argument is that Africa has needed infrastructure, but the, the primary concern or the obstacle is for them to obtain financing from the international financial market. 
And that is very true because when U.S. bankers look at a, say, a infrastructure project in Zimbabwe, they're naturally and logically concerned that what about the political risks? Do we have to work with the corrupted government in Zimbabwe? How do we make sure that our loans eventually will be paid back? So the bankers on the international financial market usually would like to avoid this type of this type of projects because it's it's just too uncertain. The commercial the commercial viability of this project of this type of projects is always debated, and that's where the Chinese come in. Because the Chinese has a different system from ours. So they have policy banks that's essentially controlled by the government. And they have state-owned enterprises who are also controlled by the government. And the Chinese government also has maintained a very good diplomatic relationship with African countries. So that creates an interesting situation where when an African country needs infrastructure, they will negotiate with the Chinese government for a law, a concessional law, provided by Chinese policy banks. And then the project will be constructed by Chinese service contractors. So it becomes a very interesting, interesting cycle. I was thinking about this on the way here. It's like if you want to build a house and you don't have the money, and you come to me, I have the money. And you ask me that, well, will you please invest in this, uh, in this commercial, in this house that I'm trying to, in, in the house that I, I'm trying to build? And then I thought about it. I said, well, if I, if I invest in your house, then I have the ownership of this new house that you're building. But I don't like the location. I don't really want to own a stake in your neighborhood. So what can I do instead is that I'm not going to invest in your house but I'm going to lend you the money so that you can build the house. But as a condition, you have to hire my construction team to build your house. So that the money essentially, and you also have to buy my material as well. So if you want to build, buy the wood or the blocks, then you have to buy my product. So essentially, the money that you borrowed from me will come back to me. And you will end up with a house which is based on the loans that I give you. I mean, 20 years' time, if you cannot repay the money that I lend you, I will still have ownership of your house. So for the Chinese, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, very good calculation. So what, one term that you really hear is a win-win solution between China and the recipient countries. And for people who really know how this, uh, how this game is played, it's China wins and China wins again. And China wins again, and a third time. So for China, this is really a, a, a pretty solid and profitable cycle because, well, first of all, China has a foreign reserve anyway, so it has to use its foreign reserve for something. And secondly, this foreign reserve being loaned to African countries will create business opportunities for Chinese products providers and Chinese service providers. Yes? I, I, I wanted to just ask her a question sure. because it, it, it's, it's the way you're framing it. In some ways, what you just said reminded me of the American Lend Lease Program, right, in 1941, before we joined the war, which really jump started our economy and helped us get out of the depression. Yeah. But the second thing that I was, that I, that you made me think about is that in some ways, what you're saying is that Chinese investment in Africa needs to be considered as Chinese domestic policy because it, it is managing unemployment in China. And it is ensuring that there is wide, there's widespread employment for people who retain both low levels of education and high levels of education in engin engineering. And so that would gain further support for the CCP because these people who have invested in their education are being employed. In that China, or it? well, that's one way to understand it. Like Belt and the Road Initiative that everyone talks about today is uh, what is the essential essence? Well, what, what is the essence of the Belt and the Road Initiative? From the very beginning, Belt and the Road, Belt and the Road Initiative in China has been regarded as an overseas stimulus package. It's Chinese domestic market running out of space for these Chinese monster service contractors or infrastructure builders. 
to expand. And if they go out of business, the Chinese government is going to have a problem of unemployment and problem of social instability. So instead, what the Chinese government decided to do is said, well, although we don't have a market anymore, Africa, Middle East, Central Asia, all these less developed countries, they have huge infrastructure market. And the only problem is that they don't have the money to build it. That's okay, we're going to loan them the money. And we're going to have them either provide government guarantee, sovereign guarantee, or provide natural resources back to loan so that our money in the end will be paid back somehow. Although that is being debated in China tremendously these days. So, but it's going to create business opportunities for our SOEs, for our companies to go abroad. So when you, when you look at that, the essential argument about BRI is that it is an overseas stimulus package targeted at the overcapacity of the Chinese domestic economy. So of course that raises a huge list of questions as for what if this is only targeted at absorbing the overcapacity of the Chinese smart, domestic market, then how much jobs does it really create in the receiving countries, which is uh, not, that, not that much. But, um, but the Chinese will argue that in, by the end of the day, the receiving countries will end up with natural uh, with uh, infrastructure projects that they otherwise would not be able to have. I hope that answers your question. And this also raises an interesting aspect that people don't really talk about, which is the word that you use, investment. A lot of these are not investment. Because if you invest, you have to, you have to be an owner of that project. And if you lose, you lose. Because you're an investor, you have assessed the business risks and opportunities. A lot of these are not, in, uh, are, not, um, are not investment. Instead, they're called, well, more broadly, development finance, but in the Chinese term, concessional loans. And that's why the Chinese foreign aid does not really equate, cannot be compared to our foreign aid, because when Western countries use foreign aid, it's usually um, grant. But for the Chinese, the foreign aid is a part of the concessional loan. So I'll give you an example. Commercial interest rate, if you get a, if you get a loan from the international financial market, say in the case of uh, Burma, you have to pay an interest rate of 9 to 10 percent because the risk is high and the market wants its fair return. But when the Chinese provide a concessional loan to Burma, they only charge an interest rate of 4 percent. So it's way below the commercial interest rate, and they call it concessional loan. So where is the foreign aid for the Chinese? The loan itself is not aid. The, the difference between the commercial interest rate and the concessional loan interest rate, that's 6 percent. That 6 percent is covered by China's foreign aid budget. So when we compare, when we talk about China's foreign aid, that, oh, well, China is providing <coughs> A three billion dollars of concessional loan to Pakistan, and some of it is uh, is for aid, but the majority of it is not. And if you look at China's investment in Africa, China's investment in Africa is actually very small. It's about three to four billion U.S. dollars a year, which is basically the smallest among all the regions in the whole world. The top, the top. Well, well, we'll see about this year because China's investment to North America, especially to the United States, has dropped about. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's ten times lower than last year because of the trade war with uh, with Trump. But in 2017, China was investing 30 billion U.S. dollars in Middle East, was investing about 30 billion dollars in in Europe, but in Africa, it's only three to four billion U.S. dollars. So that gives you another another flavor as for where does Africa really fit fit in uh, in in the Chinese priority list. So Africa important for China economically for these regions: infrastructure contracts, natural resources, concessional loans that African countries in the in the future will have to pay back eventually. So the key word is win-win. China wins, and China wins again. And if we compare, um, why is Middle East important for China economically? Of course, the top priority is always crude oil. That 43% is, is lower than before, but it's still quite significant. Another interesting issue is that if you look at China's investment in Middle East, in 2017, China actually had invested 30 billion US dollars in the Middle East. And you would ask why? Why would China invest so much in, in the Middle East? 
This is because the relatively well developed countries in, uh, in the Middle East, such as UAE or Saudi Arabia, the, the rich countries, they, still, they are regarded as relatively good investment destinations because the political risk is there, but countries like UAE, they're trying to open up, and countries, uh, they also, <coughs> these type of countries can also, um, they're also fostering the high ad value added industries, such as electronics and the, um, oh, go ahead. Right, can you just break down that, that, uh, that age, really sorry, that, that investment, I'm sorry, to the Middle East and is there specific projects? Can, can you just give a, um, the two areas that the Chinese have emphasized, one is telecommunication, two is electronics, and the third one is uh, what they call the small, small com commodity, the retail uh, industry in the Middle East. So those are the three top areas that Chinese have been investing in. But those are in the countries that are relatively developed in the, in the Middle East. But if you look at how the Chinese are also promising or also providing concessional loans or development finance to the less developed countries in the Middle East, Egypt could be an example. Like China is also treating Egypt similar to the, to the case of Africa. China provides concessional loans to build infrastructure and to support the industrialization of Egypt. Although Egypt cannot really repay China with, a, with the same kind of natural resources, but Egypt's importance in the Muslim world and Egypt's importance as a major power in the African continent has been singled out as, uh, as a key priority for China. Excuse me. Sure. Sorry. I was curious. I want to make sure I was hearing this correctly. Sure. Um, you said China is treating Egypt similarly to the case of Africa? In the case of financing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. In the case of uh, environmental finance, okay. provide provision of the uh, uh, supply of concessional okay. loans to, to Africa to build infrastructure project, and also to support in, uh, industrialization, which in the Chinese lexicon means special economic zones, so that they can build factories and attract foreign investors, and also absorb the local labor force. <coughs> So that's uh, economics in, in the case of Africa and economics in the case of the uh, Middle East. In terms of the security interest, in terms of Africa, the, primar the primary challenge for China is the security of Chinese assets and Chinese nationals in Africa. Uh, I think later this week you're going to hear about the Chinese immigrants who are Chinese actually living in the African continent. There's no specific or exact data as for how many Chinese citizens are living in Africa now. But the overall, uh, this well-speculated number is over 1 million Chinese in Africa. And in terms of the security challenges, this has been the case when, uh, for example, in the case of Libya's civil war, the Chinese 20 billion US dollars of Chinese asset was lost in that, was lost in that civil war. And China also had to dispatch its PLA to basically organize a campaign to bring back the 34,000 Chinese nationals that were living in Libya in, 2000, in 2011. So we have known that the kidnapping of Chinese citizens, sometimes Chinese workers, sometimes Chinese investors, in South Africa, in Niger, in Nigeria, has been a constant problem for the Chinese security concern in Africa. And there's also the issue of the, uh, the uh, Somali piracy that have targeted the Chinese um, tanks and Ch Chinese ships, which is why the Chinese naval forces has committed itself to the escort mission in the Gulf of Aden uh, 30 times in the past 10 years. Starting from 2008, China has dispatched 30 escort missions in the Gulf of Aden. And, but one thing that's, that we should, uh, we should notice here is that in terms of security, Africa for China is not, is not a major threat for China's homeland security, but it's the security of Chinese citizens and Chinese investments on the continent. And I'm sure everyone knows Blackwater, Eric Prince. Yes. So Eric Prince has identified this Chinese investment in Africa as a, as a, as a, as a very important area for his business uh, development. And he joined forces with Chinese companies and established a new firm called Frontier Services Group that is listed in Hong Kong, 
but aimed at providing security service to uh, to Chinese companies and Chinese personnel in um, unstable countries in Africa and in Central Asia as well as Southeast Asia. But that gives you a flavor as well what China's security concern in Africa is. And China's security concern in terms of the uh, uh, Middle East will come back to what the Chinese call the three evils, separatism, religious extremism, and the, uh, the terrorism. So more specifically, there are issues such as the Uyghur population with Muslim population in China uh, leaving China to join ISIS. For example, there, the estimate is there are at least 300 Uyghurs that are currently fighting in Syria, along with uh, with ISIS. So, um, how to so this will incorporate China into the campaign international counterterrorism campaign. But Middle East otherwise does not um, is not regarded as a major national security threat for China. There's a concern about whether the um, uh, and state instability in the Middle East is going to threaten this crude oil supply to China, which is why the Chinese has been diversifying their crude oil supply globally. They're relying more on, uh, on Russia, for example, and relying more on the United States for the uh, supply of the crude oil. Ideological interest is very interesting. In the case of Africa, we know that the Chinese do not draw a line between democratic countries in Africa or non-democratic countries in Africa. China will work with all countries, all governments in Africa, regardless of their political system. And at the first look, it appears that maybe China's non-discriminatory policy is motivated by commercial interest. That if Zimbabwe has diamonds, then China will go there, regardless of the nature of its, uh, of its government. But what it does not explain is the level of support and the, the kind of support that China is providing to countries such as Zimbabwe or Ethiopia. That if you look at how China is <coughs> providing, for example, capacity training, capacity building, or training for the government officials and the party cadres and the opinion leaders in these authoritarian African countries, there's a very clear sense that China is trying to educate African countries about China's own model of development. And China's own model of development is basically state capitalism. That politically author uh, polit political authoritarianism plus uh, economic capitalism. And that has been, China sees itself as having developed a development path that is different from the Western countries. So when they look at authoritarian countries in Africa, I have this very interesting discussion with the Chinese diplomats who work on Africa. And I asked them, why, why do you want to support authoritarian leaders like Bashir in Sudan, or Mugabe back in the days in, in Zimbabwe? And their answer is that because of survival and the very existence, or, and hopefully the prosperity, of these type of authoritarian countries in Africa proves to the world that a Western democracy is not the only way out. And it's not a, the democratic value is not the universal value. And therefore, indirectly support and justify the legitimacy of China's own political system, which is one party ruled by the Chinese Communist Party. So in this type of interaction with, uh, with, the, with the African countries, most of people would not call this export of, uh, of revolution. But I think there's a very clear, very clear trend or very clear conscious effort made by the Chinese government to one, make sure that authoritarian governments in Africa will survive, or at least not crumble because of Western intervention, and two, use China's own development model and support to educate these countries as well how they can embark on the path of economic development and economic prosperity. And that, the circle comes back to the concessional loans and the infrastructure projects that the Chinese offer to build in, uh, in African countries. It's not, a, it's, it's not an unprofitable endeavor for the, for the Chinese anyway. So I think the Chinese have uh, squared the circle fairly well. The same ideological concern in the Middle East is not really a problem for China because uh, they don't have, they don't share, well, uh, they don't share the Western democratic value anyway. 
So when China looks at Middle Eastern countries, look at Saudi Arabia, for example, or look at Iran, what the Chinese see, go back to the hegemonic stability theory, remember, this harmonious lies in the coexistence of different religions and different cultures. And the China will see that Middle East is a prime example of this type of coexistence. And last category of national interest, I call it reputational. And it goes to both the case of um, Africa and, and Middle East. Because China wants to shape well, well, shape its reputation as a global great power. Wants to shape its, build its reputation as a great stakeholder in the international politics. So China would argue that China's support for African development and China's support of the stabilization in the Middle East will qualify China or build China's case that China is a responsible stakeholder and China is not only doing business with these regions but instead China is also playing a very important role politically in the, in the region. And coming to Middle East, there's a very important phenomena, interesting phenomena that China has been able to build a good relationship with, and maintain good relationship with both Israel and the Arab world and with both Iran and Saudi which is a very interesting balancing act that when the United States has to pick and choose, yes, we, have, we are allied with, with Israel and we are allied with Saudi, and we don't see Iran as, our, uh, as, as, as a friendly country, China instead has been keen on building relationship with all Middle Eastern countries, regardless of their, um, their, their religion. So the balancing diplomacy for China also, it's because China doesn't have an ally in the Middle East. So it does not have the burden that it has to stand together with its ally. And the way that China has played this balancing act is that China imports crude oil from Saudi, but China also imports crude oil from, um, from, from Iran. And in the case of uh, China's relationship with the Arab world, China holds a China-Arab um, countries cooperation forum every few years and China supply infrastructure financing and concessional loans to the Arab countries that need it but on the other hand China also pursues very close relationship with, uh, with Israel especially in the aspect of counterterrorism. So I think China's balancing diplomacy has been regarded as, uh, as, uh, as a very sophisticated strategy. So okay just to summarize you have heard why Middle East is important for China, and you are going to hear why Africa is important for China. But I would argue that yes, they are important for their own merits, but they are not a priority of Chinese foreign policy. And here are the reasons. The first reason is that China has economic interest in these two reasons, in these two regions. But the economic relationship has been largely transactional. There's no strings attached. There's no emotions attached. So it's a business deal that China invests or China will provide concessional loans and China gets its return. And in the case of Middle East, China is buying oil, buying crude oil out of the international oil market. So there's no special arrangement that's needed for this uh, transactional relationship. As the Chinese have the money, they can buy it. And the second reason is because those two re regions both propose will present a certain level of security challenges to China. Either in terms of China's um, national assets in Africa or Chinese citizens in the region, or in the case of, uh, of Middle East, the so three evils as the Chinese would call it. But these type of security risks or security challenges are indirect. They are not on China's periphery. They do not pose a direct and immediate threat to China's homeland security. And they can be put under control as long as China pursues cooperation with the local governments. And also another very important reason that China does not see these two regions as a primary security risk for China is that the United States is carrying, is carrying most of the labor uh, or most of the burden in terms of counterterrorism. And in the case of Africa, to persuade or to maintain stability in the, in the region. That's the second reason, reason. Security risks exist, but they're not direct, and they can be controlled. And the United States is regarded as the primary responsible, responsible party for the, for the securities in those two regions. And the third 
reasons and why these two reason, regions are not priority for China's foreign policy is that although China has different political interests, either in Africa or in the Middle East, to gain their support multilaterally uh, at the UN or gain their support on the issue of, of Taiwan, this type of political support is also transactional. They can be purchased. So if there's something that you can buy, and you do have the money, and you know that the business deal in the end is not going to go against your, your, your interest because your loans, they have to be paid back, you would not put too much thought as for how sophisticated your strategy really needs to be. Because if, I, if I'm China, and I want to say, Ethiopia to support my agenda on Taiwan at UN, I'll just give them one, um, not one billion, 100 million US dollars of concessional loans to support their economic project, and then their support can be purchased. So this type of transactional nature of the political relationship between China and um, Africa and some Middle Eastern countries <laughs> has also manifested in um, a sense of um, a lack of prioritization of these two regions. Because they are not the major troublemakers. And when there are troubles, they can usually be smoothed with money. And that's the third region why these two re regions have not received utmost prioritization from the Chinese government. And the last but not least, China does have foreign policy or diplomatic interests in these two regions. For example, to compete with the United States as for who is a bigger supplier of, uh, of who is a bigger supporter, who is uh, a more important partner of, uh, of Africa, and who is a more important Afri uh, partner of the Middle East. So there is a diplomatic aspect of it, China's competition with the United States. But when China looks at this competition, again, it comes back to money. United States, although we are supplying a lot of foreign aid to Africa and we are also trying to build capacity and promote democracy in, in the Middle East, by the end of the day, the countries in the region seem to prefer the Chinese business approach. That they feel that the effort to change or to shape or to modernize their local governments is not as conducive or not as beneficial for the local population as a Chinese building a road or Chinese building a bridge. Because when the Chinese build a road and build a bridge, it's not a, it's not a bad deal for China to begin with, but it also benefits the local people. Well, in our case, I would say that the foreign aid that we have put in into the democratization effort in these countries, or the capacity building of this uh, capacity building for the local governments, they're received with uh, certain suspicion, certain hostility, because it does aim to well, it's very much focused on the government and it's less focused on the hard infrastructure that China is, is supplying. So when the Chinese leave, the African population will end up with a concrete project that they can use. But when the United States leave, a lot of the effect that, that we have created is intangible. And the success of our efforts is also debatable. So that's the four reasons that why um, these two regions, although they have their importance for China, they're not regarded as a high priority for China. And just to give you an anecdote, if you want to judge which country or which region is most important for, for China, there's one tell. Look at the bureaucratic ranking of the Chinese ambassador to that country. Because the more important the country is, the higher the bureaucratic ranking the Chinese ambassador will have. Like Chinese ambassador here in the United States, he has a ministerial, um, so bureaucratic ranking. So, and that is the only country in the whole world where the Chinese ambassador has ministerial ranking. But if you look at other countries, there are a couple of countries that has ambassadors with vice ministerial ranking. And those include the, the P5, so the, uh, the five permanent, uh, well, except China, the four permanent members of the UN Security Council. Um, and the United States has a ministerial ranking, the, um, the ambassador to UK, ambassador to France, and ambassador to Russia. So these ambassadors all have a vice minister ranking. And then there's a BRICS country. So Brazil, South Africa, and India. And then the other two is Russia and China. 
So these three countries also have Chinese ambassadors of vice ministerial ranking. And that's pretty much it. All the other ambassadors all over the world, they either have the director level, uh, director general level, which is the head of the of a bureau or head of a department. So we call it DG level or DDG level, deputy, deputy director general level kind of uh, bureaucratic ranking. So when you look at China's ambassadors to the whole Middle East, the highest ranking of the Chinese ambassador is a DG level person. And if you look at the Chinese, all Chinese ambassadors to Africa, the highest bureaucratic ranking is Chinese ambassador to South Africa. And that's because South Africa is one of the BRICS countries, so regarded as an emerging power. And all the other ambassadors have either a DG level or a DDG level, or even lower kind of ranking. So that's the one tale that if you want to tell whether one country is particularly important for China, look at the ranking of the ambassador. So I have uh, talked for about an hour, and I would love to discuss. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I was wondering, when you were talking about the ideological kind of bend towards the investments and trying to show there's another way to maybe get ahead than just following a Western model, yeah. do they, does it seem like there's more investments in countries that aren't already using kind of more Western democratic model, or do they try to undermine Western democratic models, or is it still more focused on? That's a very good question, because the Chinese would argue that while our investment or our financing in Africa or in other countries is not about natural resources, because we also invest in Mali, and we also invest in Ethiopia, and these countries do not have a lot of natural resources. And we are not also supporting authoritarian regimes in Zimbabwe or Sudan because we also invest a lot in South Africa. And we also invest a lot in countries like Kenya. So I think that Chinese have used this argument to, to equalize or to draw a simplified conclusion about their investment being non-discriminatory. Because if you look at countries that are indeed authoritarian countries like Sudan or Zimbabwe, other countries, Western countries, are not investing there. So China becomes a willing person or a willing party that is willing and eager to provide development finance to these governments. And because these governments do not have the financing from other countries, China emerged as very important, or in some cases, the only country that is supporting the plan of those authoritarian governments. So the Chinese would argue that while we are non-discriminatory, but I would argue that when Western countries or Western money is not present in a specific country, that makes the Chinese money particularly stand out. Now that answer the question. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, you had mentioned a lot of these countries had uh, transferred recognition from uh, the China, the, the uh, mainland China to Taiwan. I mean, Taiwan from China Taiwan to China. mainland yeah. China. Now the U.S. has what's called the, tai the Institute in Taiwan. Do these other countries also have a similar institute that uh, in some way substitutes for an embassy? They do have similar institutes. So mm -hmm. for example, Taiwan has an office called uh, TECRO, Taiwan Economic and Cultural um, mm -hmm. Representative Office. Mm -hmm. And Taiwan, the Foreign Ministry of Taiwan, also has these type of representatives office in African countries. Not all African countries, but on the, in the important ones, or mm -hmm. countries like Kenya. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that here we know that the Taiwan office carries important diplomatic and political function. Mm -hmm. But in those countries, their role has been primarily reduced to an economic one. Mm -hmm. So it's about the Taiwanese investors in their country, how to protect their interests, but it's not on the level of foreign policy or on the level of political exchanges. So yes, they do have representation, but the representation is, uh, is very limited. Uh, yes, sir. Um, In back. So I wonder if you could uh, speak to what's happening. We need to have it on a mic. We can't, people can't hear. We would just speak very loudly. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder if you could speak to what's happening in Sri Lanka and how that impacts how we interpret things like in Djibouti or in Pakistan in terms of de the, the debt that's being incurred yeah. and, and what that means in terms of the scheme of this, uh, the whole um, investment project in, in Africa. That's a very good question. So we talk about, uh, we talk about Sri Lanka a lot because there's a Hamantota port 
And a similar case that's developing is, uh, is a case of Pakistan, where China has a Guadar port. So the argument is that basically the Chinese are trying to establish their presence in the Indian Ocean. And I think Andrew talked about this uh, choke point in the Indian Ocean, the pearl, uh, the string of pearl theory. But if you look at the commercial aspect of Hamen Tocha and Guadar, it's a very different story, actually. So originally, these two projects, especially the Hamantota port, it was a project that Sri Lankan government wanted to build. And it didn't have the money. So they asked the Chinese whether the Chinese could provide the loan. The Chinese said, well, if you give the project to our companies to build, then we're going to give you the loan. And then Sri Lankan government agreed to do it. And the port was built. And the concern was the port was going to be due use because these are all deep sea ports that can someday potentially be used for naval, uh, for naval purpose. And similar to the case in the, uh, in the case of uh, Guadar Port, it was very similar. So China was originally hired. The project belonged to the Pakistani government. And the Chinese were hired as a contractor to build the port. And also in these two cases, Guadar Port and Hamantota Port, another, another common nature or common aspect is that after these ports were completed, the Chinese went home. And the governments of Sri Lanka and the government of Pakistan designated specific companies to manage the port. So China, for a very long time, had nothing to do with these two ports. But what happened was five years later, 10 years later, the, the two ports were both losing money. And the reality of losing money is that they cannot pay back the Chinese loans. So they had to renegotiate with the Chinese as for, well, we borrow the money, we build the port, and we operate the port for a decade, and we have been losing money. So what are we going to do? So they restructured the, the debt with the Chinese. And in the case of Sri Lanka and Mentoja, the Sri Lankan government gave China 90 year, 99 year lease to use the port in the hope that the Chinese can turn the port around, both to infuse the funding, the financing, to build more infrastructure to attract, um, uh, to attract ships and attract companies and also for the Chinese to, um, to make sure that the port will be profitable. So I would say that originally this was a purely economic deal, but because of China's political and strategic interest in the, in the Indian Ocean, it raises a lot of questions about what China's intention really is. And this is similar in the, in the case of Guadar, that maybe China's original intention was not to create that trap. China's original intention was to, well, first of all, give out loans, and secondly, have the Chinese companies employed to build those projects. But the end result is that when the recipient government failed to repay the loans or turn the project around to be profitable, they inevitably have to renegotiate deals with the Chinese, and the, um, and the result has raised a lot of eyebrows. I would say Djibouti is a different case because um, Djibouti has well, multiple countries have naval bases in, in Djibouti, so China is not the only one. So China is building the naval facility, or what they call the logistical center, and it's only one of the foreign countries that is interested in that aspect of, uh, of Djibouti. Um, whether it's going to create that trap, perhaps. It is but in jeopardy, I'm, isn't it? Is, I'm sorry? Is it, is it not in jeopardy now? Uh, what do you mean in jeopardy? I mean, of, of being in that trap, is it, isn't it very, a very precarious situation now? But I think the well, one essential aspect of that trap is that the sovereign, the receiving government has no other choices, and China, as the largest debtor of the uh, of the receiving government, emerges with a large accumulated amount of uh, of debt. But in the case of Djibouti, I would say Djibouti has the support or has the financial exchanges and the economic support from multiple countries. And China is not the only one. And if you look at the scale of the naval facility that they're trying to build, I don't think it is the largest naval facility in the country either. So I think Djibouti is in a relatively better position to manage the, that aspect of the debt trap. And since the US, France, Japan all have naval bases in that, in that country, these countries would not let Djibouti to end up solely in China's pocket either.
Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Earlier, uh, you had mentioned Uyghur population joining ISIS. If you could talk a little bit about that, and is you know how is that connected to China's um, effectiveness in Syria, and the appeal of ISIS to Uyghur populations, even though it seems like yeah, 300 ISIS members is too many, but still seems kind of relatively small. Yeah, well, that's a good question. What is China's position on, on ISIS? Well, when ISIS was first established, I believe in 2014, you might remember that in their in their list of enemies, China was listed as uh, as as a persecutor of a uh, Muslim population. So China was listed as uh, as a problem. Um, what happened with the Uyghur population is that because of the ethnic policy and the, the religious policy in China. China, Ch Chinese government is very concerned about this uh, distinct identity that Uyghur has been developing, right? So they want Uyghurs to remain moderate, and the Chinese Communist Party, as a Communist Party, is also atheist. So if you are government official, you're not supposed to have a religious belief. So that ends up in a lot of discriminatory policies in the in the Uyghur region. For example, they don't want children to go to religious school. They want children to attend the normal elementary school education, and they don't want children to develop strict religious belief regardless of their, of their family background. And this creates a lot of tension because Uyghur population, they still, for example, they still regard a pilgrimage to Mecca as a key important um, task for a, for a Muslim. So, and there are schools, religious schools, funded by Iranian government and funded by Saudi government in, in Uyghur autonomous region that have been helping to, uh, to maintain the religious identity of the, of, the Muslim, uh, of the Muslim population in Xinjiang. So, the Chinese government's policy created the discontent among the Uyghur population. And that started what the Uyghurs would call the, the international diaspora of the Uyghurs. And the one way that they can they can leave the country because the Chinese government also strictly controls the passport issuance to the Uyghur population. So a couple of ways that they can leave the country is that either through the Pakistan border, the, pa uh, the Afghanistan border, the Wakhan Pass is too is too difficult. So most a lot of them leave the country through the uh, through the Pakistan border. And another route for them to leave the country is through Southeast Asia. So they go to Yunnan province and Yunnan has a more than 2,000 kilometer long border, porous border with Southeast Asian countries. And then they leave Yunnan and then enter Thailand and then go from Thailand to, to Malaysia. Which is why you see this, uh, this reports about Uyghur population or Uyghur people being caught in Thailand, in Cambodia, in Malaysia. And they were uh, extradited back to back to China. And he would ask quest, have the question that why are they? They're from Xinjiang, so why are they in Southeast Asia? The reason that they're in Southeast Asia is because one, they want to go to Malaysia because that's a Muslim country, and two, from Malaysia they can have a transit to Turkey, and Turkey because uh, Uyghurs are also Turk people, and Turkey is also Turk. So Tur the Turkish government has had a very friendly policy towards the Uyghur population. The World Uyghur Congress is headquartered in uh, in in Turkey. So the other so which is explain, explaining why the Uyghur population once they end up in um, in Southeast Asia they will try to transit to Turkey and then to Europe. And starting from 2015, we've seen Uyghur fighters in the ISIS, which is not really new, because even in the U.S. war, the counterterrorism war in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. Uyghur fighters can always be identified. Where they joined the jihad, where they joined the uh, the local terrorist cells to fight, um, to well, first of all receive training, and then fight and gain some experience. And the original hope is that after they gain the combat experience, they would go back to Xinjiang autonomous region to support the Uyghur campaign. But because of the difficulty to go back to China. And because of the counterterrorism effort of the international community, a lot of them bogged down in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and in this, in the case of Syria, they ended up in Syria. So I think that's an issue that the Chinese have identified as a security threat. 
but I don't think the Chinese government has developed a comprehensive strategy because it's only 300 Uyghurs fighting in Syria. They are not 300 Uyghurs returning to Xinjiang to fight the Chinese government. So that's why the Chinese government is concerned, but the level of concern is not as high as uh, some other countries. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Does Chinese government see Uyghur as Chinese people? And how, how, what is the comparison with the Tibet also? Tibetan. Oh, that's a very good question. Do they see them as Chinese citizens? They do see them as, as, as Chinese. It's just not as Han Chinese. And, and how many Chinese groups? There are 56 ethnic groups in China, and the largest one being the Han majority, and the others, the Manchu, the Tibet, the Hui, the Mongolians, the Uyghurs, the Zhuang, they are the, uh, the ethnic minorities. The problem with China, well, not a problem, the reality of China is that the Han population is such overwhelming majority. It is 91% of the country's whole population. So it is very difficult for these ethnic min min minorities to really to develop a big enough voice to oppose to the Han central government. If you look at the central government, they are overwhelmingly, well, predominantly Han. And the Han government would give the ethnic minorities some senior positions <coughs> as a declaration to show the world that, look, ethnic minorities also have important positions in our government. But they don't really play a key role. A problem with the Xinjiang Autonomous Region is that when China, the Chinese central government first obtained control of Xinjiang in early 1950s, <coughs> the primary, the majority population in Xinjiang was Uyghur and other ethnic minorities. They were not Han. But the Chinese government realized that this ethnic identity or this homogeneity of the Uyghur population in Xinjiang create separatist tendencies. Because the more different you are, the more different you want to stay. And in that logic, the more independent identity you want to maintain. And the Chinese government saw that as a danger to the ethnic unity or the integration of the whole country. So what they chose to do is that they started to immigrate people, Han people, from, in, uh, from for example, the coastal area to Xinjiang. The Chinese government gave them money and gave them jobs and told them that relocate to Xinjiang and build your home there. So in the past 50, 60 years, this has tremendously diluted the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. So currently, Uyghur is not even the largest ethnic minority in Xinjiang anymore. It has a population for about eight to nine million people and about 48% of, uh, of, the, of the local population. So the Chinese government can claim that, well, Xinjiang is not just Uyghur Xinjiang, because we also have half of the population who are Han, who have also lived there for decades. So this has created a lot of uh, uh, discontent for the Uyghur population. They saw that Xinjiang is what they call East Turkestan as their home, and they used to be religiously and ethnically a homogeneous, a relatively homogeneous um, place. But because of the immigration policy of the Chinese central government, they are no longer the, the majority of their Uyghur autonomous region. But they are regarded as Chinese citizen. There's no doubt about that. Because if they're not regarded as Chinese citizen, then the Chinese government would be supporting an independent identity of the Uyghurs. So the Chinese government will argue that you are Chinese, but you are Chinese Uyghur. Stop children. Uh, stop children or stop no. children. Stop children. Yeah, well, I guess that's, uh, that's fair to say. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, thank you for uh, saying all the right things uh, about uh, uh, East Turkestan. Um, it's such a. Thank you. Uh, about 15 years ago, I saw, um, I believe it was uh, on the cover of the uh, Contemporary History periodical. Mm -hmm. It referred to East Turkestan as China's West Bank. China's West Bank. And you hit on the point of you know, the Chinese, ethnic Chinese being given jobs and uh, you know, places encouraged to move into, uh, into East Turkestan. And uh, so I think 
the level of oppression from what I read has surpassed even West Bank standards, if that's possible. Um, I mean, uh, you can comment whether you believe these are correct, but I understand the state of surveillance in uh, East Turkestan is, it's just like unbelievable levels to the point that they are even putting Han Chinese officials in the homes of Uyghurs, that they're monitoring them every, 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 every move. And there are also reports that concentration camps have been built, and hundreds of thousands of people are being, you know, just hoarded into these places where they're forced to eat pork and drink alcohol, and God knows what else goes on in those, you know, in those centers. And apparently, the region is rich in oil and gas and other, you know, uh, that main, main motivating point. And they, you know the Uyghurs have left, have lost, you know all most of the wealth and the land of the of, of the you know country yeah. since the Chinese communists I believe under Mao took over first yeah. and renamed the, the uh, region Xinjiang, China, in Chinese means new territory. Yeah. You know I think it might be good for you know people who are more neutral to refer to it as East Turkestan or Uyghuristan. Instead of, you know, maybe, I don't know if, if international law that's allowed, I mean, can you, con you know, conquer land? I, I think it's by force. I don't think that's, <laughs> it sounds, it doesn't sound right to me. I'm not a law expert, but uh, anyway. I agree. I think the, um, the history is, is quite sad. In fact, in the, you, you, might, you might know this, um, in 1921 to 23, Mongolia used to be a part of China. But the Soviet Union supported Mongolia to become independent, and they had a they had a fat referendum domestically, and Mongolia in the end decided to be independent. And when we look at how Xinjiang compared to Mongolia, had the Soviet Union also supported a similar campaign in Xinjiang, the Uyghur or East Turkestan would have been independent. And had Soviet Union assimilated Xinjiang into the territory of Soviet Union, then so in the 1990s, East Turkestan would have been, become an independent state. But then the reality is that it did not. And the reality is that the Chinese government in 1950 did send PLA troops to conquer Xinjiang. And similar in the case of, of Tibet, so there are a lot of comparisons being made between Xinjiang and Tibet. And the, the treatment of the Xinjiang population is very different from the treatment of the Tibetan population. One, because Tibet is, well, in terms of the territory, the territory, Tibet is smaller. And because of the natural condition, a lot of the Tibetan populations, they congregate in certain townships or in certain counties. And the Tibetan population is also much smaller compared to the Uyghur population, which means that the Chinese central government has adopted a, I would say the policy towards the Uyghurs is coercive, but the, the policy towards the, the Tibetans is more, um, what is the best word? It's, it's more bribery. The Tibetans, they have enjoyed a better treatment in terms of government budget, in terms of the um, subsidy that they receive from the central government, but the Uyghur population have not. I it's think in case of Tibet, it's because of Dalai Lama's stature in the world. Yeah, there's a very important aspect of Dalai Lama as well. But in the in terms of the human rights violations in the Xinjiang autonomous region, it is concerns for everybody. It is concerns for US governments, although but this current government is not saying much about it. <laughs> Um, but it has raised concerns all over the world. But the problem is, if you are foreign governments and you want to raise concern about the Uyghur issue in China, you are going to run the risk of piss off the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of political and economic costs attached to it. Then remember in the case of uh, Norway, Norway, although its economy really doesn't depend on China, but when the no Nobel Peace Prize Committee awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to Liu Xiaobo, who was a Chinese political dissident. Norway had a whole nine years of diplomatic winter with China. So that all the negotiations about free trade agreement was, was suspended, and all the trade was frozen, 
and the Chinese refused to cooperate with Norway economically in almost every single aspect. So that's in Norway. Norway is a very rich country in the world. But if you look at other countries, not all countries have the luxury to be able to do that and to say that. So how to deal with that problem collectively is a big problem for the international community because the Chinese have money and cash does talk. Oh, 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 oh. Lunch is here. That's oh. the main thing.